My title, uh, as <clears throat> Pastor Makota said, if the foundations are destroyed, what can the righteous do? That text is taken from um, Psalm 11, verse 3. And as we celebrate the 4th of July this Tuesday and our nation's independence from Great Britain, uh, we often think about the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution. Of course, that came later. Um, the term foundations in my text from Psalm 11.3 bears out a relationship between two words in the preamble of the Constitution. Those two words are establish justice, very important. Now, I want to say from the get-go that God's justice is absolute and it's perfect. Our Constitution's justice, and as you see today, is not perfect. And I believe God has a remedy for all of this. And um, anyway, I'm going to read the preamble. And remember the, uh, the words establish justice. It says, we the people of the United States in order to form a more perfect union, establish justice, ensure domestic tranquility, provide for a common defense, promote the general welfare, secure the general blessings of liberty to ourselves and our posterity, do ordain and establish this constitution of the United States. Why is that important when we talk about justice and righteousness? Psalm 89, 14, and this is very important, says that justice and righteousness is the foundation of God's throne. Those terms are used throughout the Bible, and especially in the Old Testament, and it applies to everything, everything, as we're going to see as we go, but I will limit it because of time to some specific things, because it is a broad subject, and I would say that it is vitally important for all of us to know your Bible and to understand these terms because they are foundation, foundational and they are dear to God's heart and everything flows from there. God's mercy and love flows from there and everything in between. So how do we recover this? Let's look at Psalm 11, one through three where uh, the title of my message is found. <clears throat> In the Lord I put my trust. How can you say to my soul, flee as a bird to your mountain? For look, their wicked bend their bow. They make ready their arrow on the string that they may shoot secretly at the upright in heart. If the foundations are destroyed, what can the righteous do? Uh, the context here is that under King Saul, law and order has collapsed, and David has become public enemy number one because he is a threat to Saul and his kingdom. He knows that David will become king one day because Saul has been rejected for, uh, by God for disobedience. David is on Saul's radar constantly, and seems to be one step away from being destroyed. Much like today, law and order is breaking down and justice seems to be fleeing. Christians more and more are becoming enemies of the state. The image of God is being destroyed by rampant divorce in the church and the nation, social justice, critical race theory, LGBTQ, which stands for lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, and queer. I just call it the alphabet. That's <laughs> my cold word. Anyway, um, all of these are rooted in secular humanism. This is why Christians especially are a threat to the government. Why? Because the government and secular humanism is rooted in the state and man being God. The answer to this threat is found in verses four through six. The Lord is in his holy temple. The Lord's throne is in heaven. God is still worthy to be praised and worshiped. He still is ruling from the throne where righteousness and justice are its foundation. 
verses 4b through 5. His eyes behold, his eyelids test the sons of men. The Lord tests the righteous, but the wicked and the one who loves violence his soul hates. Everyone is being tested, including the righteous, to see who will be loyal and just in the midst of injustice. That's a challenge if you haven't noticed. You ever feel like yelling at the TV? <laughs> no, nobody can relate, relate to that. Um, yeah, so uh, these things uh, are, are, are challenging us and have been especially in the last three years. Jesus loved his enemies, but he warned them that if they didn't repent, judgment was coming. Okay, verse 6, And upon the wicked he will rain coals, fire, and brimstone, and a burning wind shall be the portion of their cup. And he's quoting there from uh, Genesis 19.4, and uh, that says, 19.24, excuse me. Then the Lord rained brimstone and fire on Sodom and Gomorrah from the Lord out of heaven. So that's what the imagery there is, is depicting. But it reminds me of the bombs that were dropped on Germany, on German cities in World War II, that many times ignited firestorms that, uh, caused, uh, that caused it to get so hot that it, it went up to about 1,900 degrees in the center. So that's, uh, that gives you an idea of God's wrath and what happened at, uh, at, at Sodom and Gomorrah. Okay, where these cities in Germany, uh, they were incinerated in ashes, perhaps God's justice for their violence. Sin received its due penalty of justice on these wicked cities. I believe justice is the number one issue during our time. As it seems to be disappearing, the only source of it will come from God's throne. The condition uh, is we must participate with, with him through our relationship and ability to bring his hand into any given situation. You and I have that place with God. And we'll understand that as we look at Abraham's life as uh, I'm going to read here. Abraham is a good example of an agent of God's justice. We'll examine uh, Genesis 18, 16 through 33. It says, Then the men rose from there and looked toward Sodom, and Abraham went with them to send them away. And the Lord said, Shall I hide from Abraham what I am doing? Since Abraham shall surely become a great and mighty nation, and all the nations of the earth shall be blessed, shall be blessed in him. For I have known him in order that he may command his children and household after him, that they may keep the way of the Lord to do righteousness and justice, that the Lord may bring to Abraham what he has spoken. What stands out in that passage is righteousness and justice. Why it's important is because God was looking at that, engaging Abraham's behavior and way by how he was conducting his affairs, teaching his household and his children in the ways of righteousness and justice. And that designated him to become a great and mighty nation and the father of of many nations. So we see righteousness and justice covers the gamut of everything from the individual to our children and all the way to our nation, our government, everything. Why? Because the kingdom of God, that is the foundation of Jesus. That's the foundation of his throne. And when we say prayers like your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven, we have to keep things like that in mind. So it is so important what we are teaching our children in this day and age and the challenges we see that are happening and tearing our nation apart. I'm glad to see there are some things going on uh, that give me, give me hope and give me pause besides my relationship with the Lord. When I look at things like 
the Supreme Court and its uh, ruling reversing uh, affirmative action, which is nothing but discrimination in reverse. So you don't, you don't solve the problem of discrimination by discriminating more. And that's what has gone on. And these things should never be because they are a threat to our foundations, okay? So righteousness and justice stands out. And it's the first place uh, in the Bible that it's mentioned. And somebody said that when a certain term is used for the first time, pay attention. Very important. Pay attention to that because it will tell you a lot. Engage and govern uh, and connect to things that you will read about again when those terms come up. They used to be so common, and yeah, yeah, I read through the Bible a lot, and I, I never gave it much pause till a few, few years ago. The Lord began to speak to me about this. And he told me, I think back in, uh, I don't know, early 2000, he said, Greg, he said, the number one issue is going to be about justice and righteousness in this nation and in the world. And it's important that Christians understand my righteousness and justice versus what we, what's been, been passed off and taught and modeled as justice today. Can I get an amen on that to let me know you're with me? <laughs> A few of you at least. Okay, good. Uh, all right. Doing righteousness and justice again qualified Abraham to become a great and mighty nation and a blessing to all the nations. Abraham's name means, and probably most of you know this, the father of many nations from Genesis uh, 17.5. Perhaps uh, it could be said he is the founding father of all the nations. If that is true, then all nations should be should, should be on the foundation of righteousness and justice patterned after God's throne. When it says go into all the world and make disciples of all nations, or it can read disciple the nations, then, and teaching them to observe all that Jesus said I commanded you, and that would have been the Old and New Testament, then you know that we have to ask ourselves, can Lord, you're called the king of the nations, Psalm 2. And that being so, then certainly nations ought to order their ways and pattern after the government of God, I believe. And, um, and it says that judges and kings, they're going to answer to him. It says that they are to bow down to him. They are to fear him. Why? Because he holds them accountable and they have such a high privileged place to speak and should be speaking on his behalf when they decree statutes and judgments and laws in our land. And you can be sure that's why we need to pray for them continuously because of the, the high responsibility that they had. The word Elohim in the Bible refers to judges in Psalm 82, not because they were God, Elohim meaning God, but not because they were God, but because God, they so represented him. And they, it was so near and dear to his heart and reflected his nature and image and love and orderliness, wanting to bless societies. Abraham was called to be a blessing to the nations. That's how we become a blessing to the nations. His laws make things good. And uh, we saw that in Israel. And uh, boy, I could go through many things, but I, I can't do that for the sake of time. So I better get back on track here. Okay. Um, yeah, if that is true, what I said about Abraham, then all the nations should be the foundation, should be on the foundation of righteousness and justice patterned after God's throne. Proverbs 8, 15 through 16 says, By me, kings reign and rulers decree justice. By me, princes rule and nobles, all the judges of the earth. They also, as we said before, they will be judged by those same standards, those in those places. Okay, and to restore the foundations, God needs agents of justice like Abraham. 
you and I can have that privilege before his throne. Uh, will you be one of those agents? Will you be one of those agents? Think of that place of responsibility in prayer. Okay, we go ahead here. Um, God gave him a voice in judgment in participating with the Lord in determining the fate of wicked nation of a wicked nation immersed in the perversion of immorality. And uh, I'm going to read, go on and read verses 20 through 23. And the Lord said, because the outcry against Sodom and Gomorrah is great, and because their sin is very grave, I will go down now and see whether they have done altogether according to the outcry that has come to me, and if not, I will know. Then the men turned away from there and went towards Sodom. But Abraham stood before the Lord. In verse 23, And Abraham came near and said, Would you also destroy the righteous with the wicked? And the reason for the question was his nephew Lot and his family were in danger on two fronts. The first was God's wrath possibly being poured out on that nation. And of course, Lot and his family lived there. The second danger was Lot's house was surrounded by all the people of Sodom intending to rape the two angels and Lot. The angels struck the wicked perverts with blindness to stop the assault and direct them elsewhere. This is why Abraham asked the question in verse 23. I believe Abraham acted as an agent of justice in sparing Lot and the two, his two daughters from God's wrath and harm by the wicked Sodomites. In verses 24 through 33, and I'm not going to, for time, not going to read them, but I am going to comment, make a few comments. Abra um, in, in those verses, Abraham's intercession demonstrates God's reluctance not to show mercy in his willingness to spare these objects of his wrath if he can find just ten righteous among them to spare them from being objects of his wrath. The negotiation, the, the negotiating went from 50 all the way down to 10. I think Abraham was very surprised at God's patience with his request and that the Lord would have spared their lives if 10 righteous could be found. I mean, look what we've just read about and look at the degree of the depravity and the perversion in what they were trying to do, and everyone in that city. But if God could find ten righteous there, amazing, he would spare that place. Talk about the mercy of God. Some, somebody said that the Old Testament is, uh, God had, had, a, had a temper tantrum, and in the New Testament he got saved. That's a joke. But uh, because we don't understand the Old Testament, and we don't see all the numbers of places where God showed his mercy and did not want to show his wrath. Someone said it's, it wasn't the presence of evil as much as it is the absence of good. Something to think about. That has to be the case in our nation, but how long is the question. I wanted to comment on the statement in verse 25 where Abraham continues questioning the Lord about destroying the wicked with the righteous. He makes the statement, shall not the judge of all the earth do right? The Hebrew word shafat means a judge. The Hebrew word mishpat means justice, just, or right. Mishpat's origin is from shafat. Why am I bringing all this up? Mishpat is the second word for justice or judgment, sometimes translated, as ascribed to Abraham in verse 19. The implication is, as I said before, Abraham was given a voice in judgment concerning Sodom and Gomorrah because his foundation was aligned with God, the judge of the whole earth. How did, the, how did righteousness and justice characterize Abraham's life? They, they did in two areas, and that's worship and his conduct. If worship, in worship, Abraham built altars to bring the difficult, his difficulties to God. 
His greatest test was sacrificing his son Isaac, his promised heir, when he offered him in worship to the Lord, Genesis 22. The test proved Abraham's love for God above his greatest earthly possession that could have been forfeited, that could have forfeited his inheritance had God not stopped his hand from slaying his only son. And of course, the big difference is God didn't stop his hand on his only begotten son. But he, he experienced everything that we should have and even more. And that's his love. And that's something to think about really clear. If, especially if you don't have a relationship with him or perhaps you're not walking in that place with him that you need to be. These are sobering times. Okay, in verse 18, after he does that and God stops him, in verse 18, he tells Abraham, In your seed all the nations of the earth shall be blessed because you obeyed my voice. The second area had to do with Abraham's ethics and conduct. In Genesis 26, 1 and 2, paraphrase, God tells Isaac to stay in the land and not go to Egypt like his father Abraham did during a previous famine because God would supply in the famine. In verses 3 through 5, the Lord repeats the Abrahamic covenant to Isaac. In your seed, all the nations of the earth shall be blessed because Abraham obeyed my voice. He kept my charge, my commandments, my statutes, and my law. And those things are the components of righteousness and justice. When we, to understand the full broad connection or definition of that, then we need to think in terms like this. And, you know, Moses told the people of Israel, the nations around you are going to say, what God is there like your God that you can access any time? And he will answer. And he will come and he will change impossible situations. And they will say, what nation has the kinds of laws your nation has? And you know, that's exactly what happened when they came to, um, when they came to Solomon, the Queen of Sheba. All the kings of the earth came to hear his wisdom, to see his splendor, to see his glory. Why? Because the, uh, the Queen of Sheba said, the, the God chose you because you do righteousness and justice. Because they did that, there was a holy quality. There was a blessing. There was prosperity. There was a standard of living. There was magnificence that all the nations saw that had its, God's stamp and approval and his glory and his hand upon. The United States at one time was like that. The Ten Commandments were in more state uh, houses across this nation than probably many churches. So we need to revisit uh, we need to revisit our history again. We need to teach it to our children because these were the things that made us great at one time. And then it began to erode. Abraham surely modeled righteousness and justice to his children and household that qualified him to be an agent of justice for God. What about you and me? Do you only worship on Sundays? What about the rest of the week? Even throughout the day, God wants our worship to become a way of life. How are you treating those in your home, at work, at school, in the marketplace, at church? God wants our ethics to match our worship. And uh, the problem was in Israel, many times they did not match. And that's why the prophets were always having to go to them. And God's saying, look, I'm tired of your festivals. I'm tired of your songs. I'm tired of uh, your sacrifices this is what you need to do. You need to begin to treat one another in my image and the way that I treat you because that is what I have commanded and that expresses and shows who I am, who my character is. And my blessing will be seen on you if you will do these things. And our worship can become that way too. If our character is not matching in these times, church, it is so <laughs> it is so important that we get this and that we are really taking stock of ourselves. 
and allowing God to search you and me so that we will be able to stand whatever tests come because we don't know what's ahead. COVID threw us for a loop and it was a difficult time for many, but you know, God many times will send things to see what we'll do too. Because if we don't learn and take these things seriously, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not accusing anybody here, please. I'm speaking in generalities to the church and to myself, okay? But these are the things that are vitally important if you and I are to see the foundations of our nation once again restored. After all that, I gotta take a breath. <laughs> okay. So I've observed in my 50 years as a Christian, calls for repentance for our nation centered around 2 Chronicles 7.14, if my people. But why so little change? You know, I have to say in 50 years, I've seen it get worse and worse. You know, unless your eschatology uh, dictates that to you that, you know, well, it's supposed to, isn't it? Well, I, I just don't want to go on thinking something when God's been trying to speak all along saying, but you don't know when I'm coming. And this is what I, I expect my church to be, you know, without spot or wrinkle, without blemish, in all of her glory. Really? Well, that's what it says till we all come to the full stature of a mature man, too. That's, that's the corporate body of Christ, folks. So I'm revisiting a book called Calvary Road, and in it, the author talks about personal revival and hindrances to it. He lists things that many in the church do not think as sin, nor think that it's a big deal. Things that spring from self, such as self-energy, self-complacency and service, self-pity in trials or difficulties, self-seeking in business or Christian work, self-indulgence in one's spare time, sens sensitiveness, touchiness, resentment, and the idolatry of opinionation. Ouch. You know, sometimes, and, and Christians too, I don't care what you do, I'm just not changing what I believe. And sometimes God can't change us because we refuse to listen to him. Or we think this is the way we've always done it. And the Lord's saying, look, in these times, you can't do things the same way. It's like he told Joshua, you've never passed this way before and you're facing giants and church. If we haven't seen it by now, then you're not. <laughs> I don't know what's going to take to wake, wake you up, to wake me up. Okay, um, yeah, if we do not recognize these as sin and repent of them quickly, then we hinder our relationship with God and his people. We also lose our effectiveness in being an agent of God's justice. Sometimes our repentance may require us to go to those who we have offended or who have offended us. I've been learning to be a quick repenter over the years. I've had to be broken of a lot of pride and image along the way. And sometimes it's not too nice, but you know, it is needed. And I gotta tell you, when, when you feel lousy, when you feel, ah, you know, and yet God then begins to change you. A joy comes, a joy comes to your life. And you're going, man, I never thought I would see daylight ever again. Been through a few of those, and I suspect some of you, maybe many of you have, you know. Psalm 99, 4 and 5 says, Show us, shows us the connection with worship and righteousness and justice. <clears throat> the king's strength loves justice. You have established equity. You have executed justice and righteousness in Jacob. Even the Lord our God, exalt the Lord our God and worship at his footstool. When justice and righteousness is established from God's throne on our gatherings, then our worship will bring down the strongholds of our enemies. That's what it means, our enemies become a footstool. When there's the kind of worship, like the sound of many waters, that will so resonate that will become so 
great and powerful that it will elicit all of heaven on the side of the church to destroy and bring down the enemies of the gospel and the enemies that seek to destroy the foundations of our faith and of our nation. Some of the sins cited above can be personal strongholds in our lives. They can, they, they too can be defeated. And you and I can become agents of God's justice and restore the foundations that have been destroyed. God presently is shaking our foundations to show whether they are eternal or temporal. In closing, let's look at some agents of justice. In Acts 12, 5, continuous prayer was offered by the church to Peter, who was about to be exalted by Herod like the Apostle James. Instead, Peter was freed by an angel, and Herod was executed by an angel. Okay? Throne justice. God's justice came. Why? Because the church was praying constantly, constantly for Peter. And they saw the gravity of what had been done to the Apostle James. And Herod met his fate. His death was so grisly. I've read it in some accounts of, um, I can't think who it is, but anyway, worms were eating him for about five days. That's how bad it is. You don't mess with God, okay? In 1953, a group of pastors and their congregations heard that Stalin, premier of Russia, was about to conduct a purge to exterminate the Jews that were there. They fasted and prayed for a day, and a week later, to the very day, Stalin died. No one prayed for his death. Justice was served, and the Jews were not harmed. And get this, many of the Jews today have dual citizenship in Russia and Israel. There was tremendous fruit from that time and that time of prayer and fasting. We need to read these testimonies through history. They need to stir us. We, read, we sang some songs here about revival and about being stirred up. Hallelujah. And that's what God wants to do is to stir us up and stir us up with a purpose because he's on the throne and he rules. He rules and he doesn't want you and I to be afraid. He, in fact, he wants you and I to participate with him in bringing down the things that we have been talking about here. Another th uh, incident. In 1980, a Bible teacher taught a group of intercessors for Germany that if German people would repent together, east and west, they could destroy the strongholds of division that were keeping the Berlin Wall in place. They did, and God sent a strong prayer movement in East Germany that the secret police could not stop. Usually they haul them away, execute them, <laughs> torture them, but they couldn't stop it. The wall collapsed in 1989 during this movement. It wasn't because of Reagan or Bush. They just happened to be on the receiving end, perhaps, of having a part in it. That's God's grace. But it was all the warfare of prayer and worship behind the scenes that brought down the powers of darkness that had kept these people enslaved and in bondage. Lastly, a young woman in my church in Catalina interrupted a deacon meeting I was conducting, and she was doubled up in agonizing pain. She said she had been to see three doctors over a stomach problem that had been prayed for, but no long-term relief. This had been going on for two years, unknown to me. I began reading scripture over her, and the more I read, the louder she got, and the more intense the pain grew. I could feel the tenseness in the room with the deacons on edge, probably thinking, in fact, they told me later, probably thinking, why don't you call an ambulance or take her to the hospital? 
Well, that would have been the compassionate thing to have done, but she had had all that before. And the Holy Spirit was just driving me. You know, I, I, couldn't, I couldn't stop. I was just, you know, I was unstoppable. There was something driving me inside to see justice done in her behalf. And in the middle of it all, I recognized the loudness of her screams crying out, pain, pain, no, it's not working. And I knew that to be a demon. I could hear the Lord saying, that's the name of the spirit crying pain. I sensed boldness and authority rise up and I casted the demon out of her and instantly she was healed. She needed justice, not human compassion. Uh, otherwise, I mean, in the natural, I'd done the same thing. I prayed for her, that's not helping, I'd take her to the hospital or call for an ambulance. But the Holy Spirit was in this and he wanted justice to be done. So it was an honor to be an agent of justice and bringing a solution to my dear sister's problem that until then yielded no solution. There are many more testimonies that could be shared about impossible situations like our nation and the world we are facing today. The question we need to ask ourselves, church, do we want to just read about them or do we want to be an agent of God's justice in restoring the foundations that, that he wants established. In doing so, it is an honor for every believer. And Psalm 149 says, this honor have all his saints. And that's the end. Oh, I'm gonna pray. We you bow your heads, please? Father in heaven, you're a good God. You're a loving God. But you're a just God too, Lord. And there are things that make you angry. And Lord, you're so jealous for each of us. And I pray, Lord, whatever is needed today, I pray for comfort for everyone that needs comfort to be lifted up, to be encouraged, to be given hope. God, to know that we can be candidates like Abraham and about those that we've read about. Every one of us are eligible. And that intercessors are not a certain class of people, but they are everybody. Sometimes we think, well, you have a gift to pray, and that's not me. Well, no, you learn. You learn to pray by praying. You learn in small groups. You learn at home. You learn with an individual. That's how you learn to pray. And I was a very intimidated and fearful person uh, before I got saved, but God changed all that, and he can you too. Lord, thank you. And I, God, I just believe your hands on this church. This isn't a scolding to because you're mad at everybody, but Lord, I just believe that there is, your hand is on these dear people. And there are things that they express in the image of God here that is unique. And I, I have been blessed by it. I've been humbled by it too in many ways. And I'm thankful, God, for these people at San Diego Japanese Christian Church. It's a privilege, Lord. I'm humbled to be here. And that's my heart towards every person, Lord, in this room, because I believe that a prayer movement can come to this church that can affect San Diego. And that gets me excited when I say it, when I pray it, and I believe that's what God wants to do. Prepare your hearts. If repentance is needed, repent. If it's a step of obedience, then obey him. All of us, let's encourage one another. And uh, let's rise up as the bride of Christ again and be who he's called us to be. And uh, not read about it in testimonials only. God, thank you. And I pray those that need salvation would receive you, open up their hearts to you, and say, Jesus, come into my life. I repent of my sins. Lord, change me. And uh, I want to grow in you. I want to walk with you. I want to love you. Thank you for dying for my sins. And God, just anything else in between. Lord, I thank you for this dear, beloved church. In Jesus' mighty name.